Hi, everybody. I think I'm really loud on this, so I'm going to maybe move this down a little bit. Is that better? I tend to talk loud, too, so I'm not sure if I sound like Minnie Mouse or Elizabeth Heath. Is that OK? Good? Welcome, everyone. We're going to talk about a really important topic tonight, data stewardship, a matter of life and death. The topic of life and death is something that I am unfortunately all too familiar with because as a cancer doctor, I see it a lot, too much. Cancer strikes many of us and we have to have ways to successfully deal with it. And as many of you know, cancer happens when cells grow out of control and they crowd out normal cells. And if cancer doctors like me can't contain this or slow it down or get rid of it, patients will die. Last year alone in the United States, 1.7 million people were diagnosed with cancer. And unfortunately, 600,000 succumbed to their disease. And we know that cancer affects not just the patient, but the family, the community, and society as a whole. The greater scientific community, we understand this, and we're continuing to work at a rapid pace to try to discover new advancements. Because our hope is that when we do that, we can contribute to the rising number of cancer survivors 15.5 million today and counting. And we have to be proud of that. One of the coolest things that's happened recently is this field known as precision medicine. Precision medicine is when we take the patient's genetic information, protein, environment, and figure out how that can be used to help develop new technology, new drugs to treat, detect, so that we can really help cancer patients. That is a game changer, a big time game changer. Now to be fair, in the field of medicine, there have been other game changers. I'm sure many of you in the audience can at least name one. And one is antibiotics that were discovered many years ago like penicillin. So in the 87 years that penicillin has been discovered, many other classes of antibiotics were discovered. And thank goodness for that. Why? Because we've treated and helped many people with infections, overcome it, and 100 years ago, that would not have happened. They would have suffered and died from infections. That's wonderful. But the story about antibiotics is not all good news. In fact, there might be some bad news. And the bad news is that there is an emergence of resistance to these antibiotics that many of you are already familiar with. So let's take penicillin. In the 1940s, when it was just getting used widely, by the 1950s, you had resistance developing. In the mid-90s, we had uh, levofloxacin, and later on by that year, we already had levofloxacin-resistant pneumococcus. Yikes. Do we have to worry? Well, with improper use, we might. Why is this happening? Moment of truth. Raise your hand if you've been in the doctor's office this winter with a sniffle, with an earache, with a sinus infection, maybe, with a cough, and we're all still getting rid of our coughs. And some of you got treated with antibiotics, and some of you did not. But it's a little bit all over the place. And why we worry about that, because improper use of antibiotics might lead to this resistance. And then you might get something like this which is a terrible looking leg to show right before dinner, and I'm sorry, but this is a methicillin-resistant staph 
uh, aureus infection, or MRSA, as many of you have heard through the news. And would we be worried if your leg looked like that? Yes, we would. We would be worried. We would be worried that we can't control this infection because antibiotics are no longer effective. We would be worried that this patient may actually die from this infection. So when you're thinking about what is the impact of not real use of guidelines or adherence to things, we worry that although a board game of pandemic may be fun to play with your best friends on a Friday night, or you'd like to see a movie with The Rock watching this pandemic movie with a date, it's really not fun in real life. And in fact, in real life, it's a little scary. So what we need and what's been done is a creation through hospitals and hospital systems of an antibiotic stewardship program. This is a concerted effort by the medical system to say, we better get this right, guys. And how are we going to get this right? We're going to get it right by getting all the right people to sit around the table. And we're going to figure out that we need leadership commitment, that we need action, we need education. We need all sorts of stuff to make sure we stay on track. Now, I'm not talking to you tonight about this to scare us, although I think that picture of the leg was a little scary. But even now, several days ago, the New York Times reported on a new superbug. You guys saw it flash through your smartphone. And Canada Oris is now the superbug that the Centers for Disease Control director of the fungal branch named it the creature from the Black Lagoon. You know, that's never good when somebody who knows what they're talking about names that. So I'm not saying it again to scare you, but to really remind all of us that what's really critical in this is that when game-changing science occurs, that we have a system in place to know how to provide oversight, and guidance so that we can ensure a successful and collaborative path forward. So keep that in mind as we're thinking about going back now to this concept of precision medicine. So precision medicine is when we find a genetic change in a patient's cancer. And then we're going to target that change with a new medicine. And we're going to see some success from that. And it doesn't matter whether you have prostate cancer or breast cancer or ovarian cancer, if you have that same genetic change, you can, for example, get the same pill from the purple bottle. That is a game changer. Cancer doctors like me are not used to doing that because we're used to treating disease. I'm a prostate cancer doctor, so I treat prostate cancer patients. The world is changing to a different way of looking at things. And the way we're looking at it is through the genes. So what do we know? We know that you're going to come on rounds with me. Let's go. You're on rounds with me because we're going to take care of really complicated patients. And that's me. I'm walking, thinking, learning. And we're looking at all sorts of things. Look at that CAT scan, which does not look so good for those of you who are aware of what that CAT scan should look like. We're looking at blood work. We're looking at EKGs. We're looking at all sorts of things. But in 2019 today, what we're looking for is what the cancer's genomic profile is. That is a deeper dive to the patient's genetics, really deep to figure this out. Now, why is that important? Well, because we learn all sorts of things. Big amounts of things, massive amounts of things, and I mean things as in data. So genomics is one, that's in that nice box. But you've got transcriptomics, you've got proteomics, you've got metabolomics, you have omics that haven't even been discovered yet that will end up on these slides. And what's really important is, how big of a data set are we talking about? So those of you in the audience can see Yep, there's kilobyte. I'm familiar with that. Hmm, I think I even know gigabyte. I'm familiar with that. Why? Because we all have computers, we all have our smartphones, and we understand that. But one genomic profile is one petabyte of data. Uh-oh, what's a petabyte of data? Well, a petabyte of data is a huge amount of data. Now, in real life terms, 
That's like you taking 4,000 digital photos every day for the rest of your life. Now imagine if I say, hey, by the way, what I'm looking for is a picture when you went to Disney World of you in a purple shirt wearing the Mickey ears on this certain day. Um, go ahead and tell me where that is. And the entire photo library is open for you. So a genomic profile is to look at that one genetic change at one point in time for one patient. Huge amounts of data. And did I tell you that sometimes in this patient's journey, we might check four to five times? That's a whole lot of data. It's so much data that companies that check these genomic profiles, they have massive server farms. They have massive server farms that have multiple redundant backup systems because if there was a city-wide power outage, you would not lose the data because we've all had that happen in the middle of what we're working on. Whoop, power outage, there goes your data. We can't afford that for patients. So critical to know. So then you're going to say, well, you know, does it really matter that that's one of the challenges? Yeah, you know what, it really matters. Because in 2019, the way this is going on affects how I treat my patients. You've been on rounds with me. You see how complicated it is just for regular medical stuff. Now I got to throw in this large amount of data set and figure out in real time what I need to do. But there are other challenges to big amounts of data. So let's take the first one. Lack of guidelines. Are you kidding me? Lack of guidelines? In today's cancer centers, big hospitals, small hospitals, we don't have any guidelines on how to use it. It's a bit of the Wild West. We get it. There's tons of companies. We sometimes give it to the patients. Sometimes we put it in the chart. Not sure. Should all cancer patients get genomic profiling and when? Should healthy patients get genomic profiling and when? Many of you are consumers. You've probably gotten some genetic testing over the internet because you want to know what you're predisposed to. What disease? Are you going to get heart disease? Are you going to get Alzheimer's? What cancer are you predisposed to? Who are you maybe related to? Maybe there's 3,000 brothers and sisters you didn't know you were there. This is, again, changing as we speak. The lack of infrastructure is the second worry. Now you know there's no way large amounts of data is going to live on your hard drive or in your phone. Not going to happen. So when you have it come into the hospital system, how are you going to take that in? Where are you going to keep it? Who has access to it? Should everyone have access to it? Should you as the patient have access to it? We don't have the answers. And number three, there are lack of specialists. So I don't come with the test results. I have lots of people calling me saying, uh-oh, there's a whole bunch of things here and I should know what they mean, but I don't. What should I do? So we don't have the specialists to actually know how to interpret the data. How do we know how this will impact the patient and his or her care? These are big questions, big decisions. So why am I worrying about this? You know, Dr. Heath, you're such a worry wart. Worry, 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 worry. Well, I worry because we've learned from our infectious diseases colleagues that we should worry about this stuff, otherwise things get out of control. We don't want things to get out of control because that might mean one day I show up in my office, I turn on my computer, and I hear, good morning, Dave, you're looking well today. Now, many of you who are too young to know, that's from a movie, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, and it was a science fiction movie about artificial intelligence gone rogue. But really, that's not so far-fetched in today's world. We have computers running everything with really no rules. So we need to worry about this now. And what we need and must insist upon is a creation of a molecular data stewardship program. We must learn from our infectious diseases colleagues what they've learned. We must implement the program with much of the same elements that they have used because for the most part, they've been successful. So we have to have leadership committed 
to saying, oh boy, we better really gear up our informatics. We all know how that goes with electronic medical systems. Not so hot. We need to have commitment for education. We need to have commitment for ethics and tracking and action and reaction. So that is one of the struggles that we need to do. Now, am I excited about big data? Absolutely. You guys have no idea what a true game changer that is for me. Right now, there is an FDA approved drug that's available, that's a pill, that you can say maybe came from one of the purple or green bottles, that is approved for patients with a specific genetic change. But that genetic change only occurs in two to 3% of patients with cancer. But if you're in that two to 3% group, your chance of having your cancer shrink is 75%. Huge. Big data can only mean better data if we know how to use it, if we know how to care for it, and we know how to respect it. So, a call to action for this audience. We need data stewards, and they all come in different parts. Here's just a brief example. Computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, genetic counselors, geneticists, oncologists, molecular biologists. Those of you in the audience with all of these majors, start thinking. We need the next generation data stewards to help usher us in this exciting new world of precision medicine. Who will join me? Thank you.